the a, a, a genome donor is still to come your R2 and the B genome, uh, which is peltoidates. Uh, so the, uh, when they cross together in nature, uh, they, uh, they led to tetraploid wheat uh, with A, B, B, and it, it was called dicokites. And when, when, when we started cultivating it, uh, domestication of this led to the cultivation and, and uh, triticum dicocum, it, it was cultivated around like 10,000 BCs uh, uh, before this time. But at the same time, another simultaneous uh, this, uh, crossing event happened in nature. Uh, and, and the D genome donor, which is Agilops tosha, it crossed with, uh, with, with the tetraploid uh, parent and they led to the spelt wheat or the hexaploid wheat, which, which then uh, was cultivated as a bread wheat. Or the, uh, or the our normal this, uh, common wheat we call it, uh, and the problem with this was like uh, it has it was hard threshing and there were some other traits which 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 came from uh, from the wild species. So it took a lot of time for this wheat to to be means cultivated normally, normally in the shape which we uh, do uh, nowadays. So this is how how these genomes look like. This is your R two. It looks very compact spike with. Uh, the spikes and, and the speltoidus is like it's a grass, it's very grassy when you see in nature, it looks very grassy and when, when they crossed in nature, means this is the, the evolution of uh, wheat, uh, the hexaploid wheat uh, has occurred in nature. So, but uh, we, we know that the wheat is a self-pollinated crop, so uh, one of these parents like speltoidus or toshai, they may be having a bit of uh, cross-fertilizing nature, so they, they did cross with each other and it came up to be this uh, Tetraploid wheat, when it's, this is the goat grass, or we call the D genome donor. Uh, and when we cross with this one, it, this is how, we, uh, how it evolved. I think this is very basic. Uh, you all may be knowing about this. So uh, a bit of like uh, why wheat is important. Uh, like, like there's a prediction that in the next 50 years, we will need to produce more food. Uh, then uh, what, what our population is growing at a very faster rate. So wheat becomes uh, uh, one of the major cereals after rice uh, and maize, uh, where we need to produce uh, more amounts because uh, wheat is consumed across the world in different countries in different forms. Uh, it's not uh, like region specific. Uh, wheat, uh, wheat, wheat is grown from in, across all the continents. Uh, in, it is cultivated in more than 100 countries. Uh, so it's like, uh, it's breakfast, lunch, dinner for us, all of you. We consume more wheat than, uh, than other crops. So worldwide, uh, it's cultivated on more than 225 million hectares of area. It contributes to more calories, as I have already said. Uh, its trade exceeds than all other, uh, all other grains. It's, uh, someone was asking about gluten or the proteins. So this is the speciality of wheat. It's having gluten. Uh, and uh, for, for our case, like the Indian case or the subcontinent case, it becomes more important. There was a question like higher protein or something, uh, the issues. Uh, look. Uh, we have this, uh, we have the end products that we use in India in some continents is, is the chapatis, or they call it the flat breads. It's not the breads. So for bread, you need uh, strong gluten. Strong gluten uh, is derived from high protein. So once you have high protein, it leads to strong gluten, and it's useful for producing breads. But when we come to the chapatis, we need a bit lower uh, uh, protein, a bit lower gluten. It needs to be hard in nature, but the protein content needs to be limited. So, for us, the target may be around 15, uh, to produce 15, uh, to have 15 percent protein in our wheat grains, but that is a bit higher. Because generally, for making chapatis or the flat breads they, that we use in India, uh, somewhere around for 12 or 13 percent of protein is required. So uh, it's, it's a widely adopted uh, grain across the, across the world. So in India, we, uh, we have like uh, three different species that are grown, uh, astivums, durums, uh, and the dicocums. So the bread wheat, uh, India is the only country which grows all the all the all these three species. Uh, means grows means cultivated commercially at farmers' fields. And uh, this is triticum astivum, uh, durum. This this astivum is the maximum with 95 percent. Then we have some parts in central India, Rajasthan, Gujarat, and Madhya Pradesh where they they cultivate durum wheat, uh, which is used for uh, uh, making uh, uh, macaronis and pastas and all those. And then the dicocum is some, it's less than 1% uh, cultivation in, uh, in Karnataka or in southern hills of Tamil Nadu. So worldwide, uh, uh, like we said, we, uh, India is uh, the second largest producer of wheat. Uh, recently, this year only, we crossed 100 million tons. Uh, China is number one. Uh, 
but uh, you, you can see the area, like uh, we have the maximum area uh, under wheat, uh, and our productivity, it comes around 3.5 or something like this. But for China, the area is less, and uh, the production is more. This is because uh, the, the climatic conditions or the, uh, the, the crop season duration in China is more. So you give more time for grain filling uh, and crop growth region, more grains will be filled and you will have higher yields. So the, the other genotypes are like they call it winter weeds. Uh, you may be knowing the winter weeds or the spring weeds. In India, we have spring weeds. Uh, China does have spring weeds also, but uh, majority is the winter weeds. So uh, the productivity levels are higher here. Then the third and fourth, like it's either Russia, uh, United States used to be uh, third, uh, means largest producer with around 75 million tons, but then recently uh, they, they were having some droughts and uh, they could not cultivate uh, more. So last year, uh, the figure changed, so Russia became number three. And then you have Canada also, and among others like uh, European Union. Uh, when, when we have a comprehensive view of European Union, it comes as the number one producer of uh, wheat because they have countries like Germany, France. Uh, they cultivate uh, these winter weeds, long duration weeds, and their productivity levels are seven tons, eight tons. Uh, so they produce more. But when we can uh, uh, see like individual countries, uh, number six or number seven will be Germany, France, then we have Australia. Australia is also a major producer of wheat. You may be knowing that Australian wheats are like uh, very good in quality. Uh, most of their cultivation of wheat is under rain-fed conditions. And so under rain-fed, uh, when you don't apply like more urea or more, fed, uh, more uh, other inputs, uh, the grain quality uh, becomes more, uh, means it's, it takes more time to fill in uh, the, the good proteins. Like there is, it's like uh, you have, uh, quantity of protein and then you have the quality of protein. So when you have like uh, crops, like uh, in our country also, in, when you go to Rajasthan or Madhya Pradesh, where the wheat is grown normally in rain-fed conditions. So the environmental conditions become like this, that the grain filling is very slow. It doesn't shoot up at the terminal, uh, like uh, the temperature doesn't shoot up uh, very high in the terminal. So it's very gradually the grains fail. So the quality becomes more important. The Australian wheats are famous for their quality. They are, they are the number one exporters of wheat in, uh, across the world. However, as producers, uh, they come uh, down the ladder. So I think uh, this is uh, already you guys have seen like uh, how the inception of egg grip in India and how the improved varieties and they have led to the, uh, the production of uh, means 100 million tons of wheat which we uh, recently do. What I wanted to say here is like this, this all became uh, started here with an event uh, which we, we all know as a green revolution. So you may have heard about green revolution. So let me... Uh, yeah, talk about uh, first the Indian wheat breeding, how it started, and how the Green Revolution stepped in, and we, we become the like world leaders in, uh, in case of wheat. So before like 1900s, uh, we used to have introductions from Australia, England, Egypt, when we were like uh, we are a Commonwealth nation. We used to be under England, so these were like most of the Commonwealth countries from where we used to get our wheats. So we used to make selections from them. Uh, they were like long duration. They were susceptible. They were poor grain qualities. So there was no systematic research uh, that, uh, that we used to do in case of wheat. But uh, uh, I think uh, Sir Albert Howard and Gabriela Howard, you may have heard, because uh, they, they were the husband and wife who were appointed uh, to streamline the Indian wheat program uh, in, in 1906. So they, they came up with a classification of Indian wheats. They classified Indian wheats into 100 and different, uh, 105 different types uh, from across different provinces. At that time, we were not states, we were provinces. So from every province, they tried to collect the wheat. Uh, either they were bread wheats, durum wheats, even, uh, even some of them are like daikokans from Mysore and central provinces. So this is called the Howard's collection. This becomes very important uh, in case of India because this is our own basic wheats that uh, are the land races that we say like uh, uh, the Indian, Indian weeds or Indian land races. So after that, the research work started using these, these land races and uh, uh, these, these, these names like Pusa, Laipur, Kanpur, you may be knowing like the agricultural students when you started uh, learning about agriculture, there were five colleges set, start, set up across India in early 90s. So these are the places from where, and these are the persons uh, who are associated with wheat breeding programs, and they, they came up with these, these, uh, these landmark varieties, we will say, or there were selections, like the selections from, uh, from the already uh, uh, available land races. And then hybridization programs started, like 
uh, in Lyallpur, then it was in Pakistan, uh, New Delhi, Kanpur, uh, and we came up with uh, different. So this was like uh, streamlining of uh, breeding research work uh, in India. So like uh, uh, from 1908 or 10 to 1960, uh, this was all like uh, the, the different colleges, they were working in isolation, there was no coordination among them. And the All India Coordinated uh, Wheat Research Improvement Project started in 1961 here at IRI with Dr. A.B. Joshi uh, being the coordinator of the program. And, and uh, this, this, was, uh, this started as a coordinated project and then it became a program in 1965. Uh, and, and this is what, uh, what triggered the Green Revolution. You know, uh, what, what exactly happened with Green Revolution is like we know that uh, we, we, we imported dwarf weeds from Mexico and we started cultivating them. They were, uh, they were very high yielding and blah, blah. But how, how those short weeds were developed? Uh, you may have heard about uh, this Norintan. Norintan is known as a gene, uh, is a dwarfing gene uh, uh, which is in wheat and we have a complementary or a uh, sideways gene in rice called DG, Bojan. These two different names you may have heard. So how they were developed? Uh, so this is in Japan. Uh, this, this was one, one land race which they imported from Korea. And this is of Mediterranean origin. One, uh, these two lines, they were crossed to develop this one in Germany, uh, sorry, in, uh, in Japan. And then one, again, one more race, uh, land race from Turkey, called Turkey Red. Uh, the crosses were made in 1917, and, and this, this line, like, uh, it was developed in 1935. So this is like, you will say, like, the crosses were made in 1917, and the line was developed in 1935. Like, like 1917, 16, you remember the First World War, it started. So uh, Japan and other countries, they were, side, I mean, like, sidelined, uh, and uh, uh, they, they couldn't, uh, the research work got off, like, stock up somewhere or something. But then... Uh, this fellow, Gonjiro, uh, he, he, he identified this one line, which was, uh, which was dwarf. The dwarfness is derived from this line, from the Korean line. So uh, very dwarf and uh, uh, sturdy stature. And uh, it was uh, identified, and they started uh, evaluating at their station in Japan. So uh, again, then, uh, then one more event happened in, during the Second World War. During the sec uh, uh, during Second World War, uh, this fellow, Selman, he I mean, uh, he, he got this Norintan gene or the line from, from Japan and he, he transported it to U.S. where, where uh, Oliver Weigel, in 1946, he made crosses of this Norintan with Brewer. And uh, when, when uh, these crosses were very promising, at that time, CIMIT has started working uh, in a mission mode with Rockefeller Foundation being at the base of it. So... Uh, Dr. Vogel, he, he gave some seeds of these, these crosses to Norman E. Borlaug. Norman E. Borlaug is the like, father of Green Revolution. So he started crossing with the Mexican weeds. They are like spring weeds. Mexican and Indian environments are like similar. So they grow Mexi uh, spring weeds. So this Vogel, he did in winter wheat. This is a winter wheat. And Mexican wheat for the spring weeds. So this gene, uh, this uh, parent was crossed with these lines to develop the semi-dwarf wheat varieties, which, uh, which were introduced in India in the early 60s. So, so this is the origin or, or the history of how, how the Indian program started to develop towards the Green Revolution. So the story goes like this, like semi-dwarf, they were introduced in 1962. They were planted at IRI station. Uh, and uh, Dr. Borlaug, he himself visited India the next season when, uh, when these two lines were found to be very promising. And he said, the Mexican dwarfs can do better in India. And then uh, India started importing seeds of these lines uh, from, uh, from Mexico. And they were, these lines were known, uh, means uh, they were evaluated and they became like, they are high yielding. They at least out yield Indian varieties by 30%. So at the same time, like this, this coincided with the inception of our ACRIP or the coordinated system in India. And after the recommendations of uh, Warlog and other wheat scientists in India, uh, these two were approved, these two Mexican lines that were approved for cultivation in India. And, and, and uh, because uh, you may have heard that India was like ship to mouth at that time because we didn't have enough wheat to eat. So uh, we used to import or ship our wheat from other countries. So it was called ship to mouth system. So at that time, uh, we imported these two lines in huge quantities. 
However, at the same time, uh, the India and Pakistan war, it broke up in 65, and the cargo that was carrying these seeds got stuck up in Los Angeles. And then some, some other political situations led to the division of the, the seed lot that, uh, that was supposed to come to India. So we could get a, a just uh, before showing date, uh, we could so see uh, around 7,000 acres of land using those seeds. And uh, next year, uh, the cabinet, uh, the cabinet, uh, Indian cabinet, they approved the import of uh, another 18,000 tons of wheat. And, and this is what like was a path breaking, uh, uh, path breaking system or path breaking story. You can say that developed uh, from developing those weeds to coming in India, and and the and the green revolution which we called was triggered. So out of these lines uh, that we got from uh, Mexico, uh, they were tested at uh, IRA, EPA, Ludhiana, GBA to Pantnagar. So these, 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 are, these are the two lines which, uh, which were identified at different locations based on data. And these became, they were, they were released as varieties at Kalyan, Sona, and Sonalika. So Kalyan, Sona, and Sonalika are like the, are the landmark varieties, are the mega varieties which are supposed to. Uh, because uh, the, the earlier ones which we imported from Mexico, they were having red grains. So we used to eat chapatis. The, the, the consumers never used to prefer like red chapatis or something. So uh, these are the ones which, uh, which are even improvements uh, on those red weights. So uh, the dwarf weeds uh, that uh, we developed there was they have a short stature. Uh, short stature means that they are not tall; they won't lodge. Uh, they have a sturdy straw. The straw straw strength of uh, is is what also supports the lodging. It means it, it also supports like uh, it doesn't lodge. They were having number of uh, fertile uh, florets. Like there were more number of fertile florets. They were having high tillering, and more importantly, they were fertilizer or I will say input responsive. Uh, the more fertilizer you give to them, the higher they will yield. Like the Indian land races or the, any land race which is tall in height, if you give more nitrogen, there will be more vegetative growth and they are prone to lodging and uh, you may not uh, get the desired yields. And they were also resistant to diseases. So this is like uh, 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 once, once, uh, once the system became in place, then they started crossing and hybridization. So they start every, every decade, you will find some mega cultivars. They were developed uh, across India from different, uh, different institutions. For your information, like, let, let me explain. Sonora 64, PEV 18, and LR, LR Maro 64, they were from Mexico. So then Kalyan, Sona, and Sonalika were the ones they derived from them. But uh, like these, these numbers, I think you may be aware, like these, these, denominate, these, these numbers, they denote which place these, these, these genotypes have been derived at. Like this is HD, is like hybrid Delhi. This is not exactly hybrid. Uh, in, in, in somebody is asking about hybrid. This is not exactly hybrid. But then uh, since we make crosses, so they, they denominate it a hybrid. So this is a you know, uh, uh, for a hybrid Delhi. Then this is uh, wheat Ludhiana, like WL is wheat Ludhiana, WG is wheat Gurdaspur. And this is coordinated program uh, uh, wheat. Then wheat Hisar, Uttar Pradesh wheats, Punjab bread wheats. So, so, so it's just to denominate. So every year you used to have like varieties. You may have heard these names like SD2009 or WL711. Uh, someone who asked like, uh, there is no epidemic for last so many decades and so. Uh, is it because of the varieties or like things? Like, uh, let me tell you one thing. The Kalyan, Sona, and Sonalika, they were like very high yielding genotypes. Uh, they, they, uh, they have this potential of around five, five tons. Uh, but because, because they become susceptible to rust. Uh, you may have heard, because this is on rust, most of you are pathologists, you may have heard that rust, they don't sleep, it's a killer disease. So rust evolves at a far more better pace than what we as a breeders do. Uh, wheat plant cannot uh, evolve itself. Uh, it needs us to evolve, but, but the fungus uh, it itself will evolve. So, so the fungus evolves very fast. So the varieties, they contain some genes. Once those genes are overcome by pathotypes, they become susceptible. So these are the all mega varieties. They are having a yield potential of more than six tons, seven tons. But they come to the yellow rust, like uh, SD2009, WL711. Uh, uh, they were mega varieties at that time, but uh, since they become susceptible to rust, so we have to withdraw them. So as a breeders or as a, uh, as a scientist, when we started developing varieties with different genes, different combinations, which are resistant to those evolving races of pathogens. So we, we, we sort of try to take credit for this, that we have been like developing genotypes with, with better resistance than the earlier ones, so, so that the rust epidemics didn't happen. 
So very recently, like PBW 343, it's a mega variety which, which, was, which ruled the farmers' fields for like more than 15 years. It, it also succumbed to the virulencies of yellow rust uh, in, in Punjab and Haryana states. So very recently, we have like, uh, Dr. Singh has already told you about this SG2967, 3086, and very recently the Karan Vandla are 187. So they are the ones which are having like more than seven tons, eight tons of yielding ability and resistant to different rusts. So again, this, this is the, like, uh, the year and, and, and how the yield potential of these varieties has increased. So uh, recently, uh, we have one, uh, the current one, uh, DBW-187, which was released in 2018, uh, is having around eight, eight tons of uh, yielding potential. So once, uh, once we're looking at the yielding potential, we, you can see like uh, how much we can, like uh, what is the potential? Wheat as a crop, you cannot like keep on harvesting from it like 10 tons, 20 tons, 50 tons. It doesn't go like that. So it's having a potential, it's having a limit. So this is what we theoretically calculate is 20 tons is what wheat can give us. Uh, 14, uh, this, is, uh, this is a bit uh, older figure for me. It's around 15 something, which a farmer in New Zealand has recently harvested like 15 tons of, uh, from, 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 from one, one acre, uh, sorry, hectare. So this is what Mexican farmers do. Uh, this is like we in Punjab, or Punjab, Haryana, the northwestern parts of India, uh, have, the farmers have harvested more than seven, seven tons. This is the Punjab average, and this is the India average uh, for this year. And, 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 and you see like the, uh, the tall, the traditional Indian wheat that we used to grow, or even uh, four tons or less than four tons. Yeah, uh, then the development of varieties like uh, somebody was talking about the biotechnology. It has emerged, it's still emerging, whatever. But uh, like this is one classic example. As a student, I would like to like uh, uh, introduce to you this uh, variety PBW. Uh, this is called Unnat PBW uh, 343, uh, and it has been released as uh, PBW 723. So from CVRC, it was released as PBW 723. And uh, it, it is the first wheat variety which was developed through market assisted selection and was released in India. So this is just an example of, uh, of market assisted selection being used to develop varieties. So this is the first and the only variety. This was released in 2017 uh, through market assisted selection. For, for it was, it was means, uh, it, it's, it's supposed to be the improved version of PBW343. Uh, these are these were the genes, wire 17, wire 40, uh, or the, the, the allelic genes. So they were combined or integrated into this variety uh, to develop as a marker marker assisted uh, variety of wheat. At the same time, uh, the biofortified varieties uh, WB2 and PBW1, yeah, HPBW01. These these both these varieties they were released together. Uh, uh, in the same year, in the same trials, and the same meeting. So we proposed them together as India's first biofortified wheat varieties. So this was about how, what varieties we developed. Uh, the later part of my presentation is about the problems and uh, the issues that uh, the Indian wheat program is facing. I think uh, Dr. Singh has already um, given a very comprehensive detail about that. I will just go through like different aspects like the rust, the leaf blights, canal bent, loose mud, other diseases, uh, antibiotic, it's heat, rot, water logging. So this is like the areas where, where, where these, these are the major problems across the northern states, somewhere in Punjab, Haryana, and uh, uh, the eastern UP, uh, eastern Rajasthan, western Uttar Pradesh. The other diseases like leaf rust or stem rust, they, they, they go down here in the south, the peninsular India, the central India, because the rusts are most important disease uh, in wheat. And uh, there are three different types of rust. I think, yeah, I have a picture here. So uh, the yellow rust, uh, the black rust, and the leaf rust, or the brown rust. So the black rust is it's, it requires a bit uh, as a pathologist you may be knowing like higher temperature warmer or more humid areas yellow rust is more preferred in the cooler areas so this is a problem in northern India where the weathers are very cool uh, temperatures go below uh, below 13 or below 15 degrees 
and this is uh, uh, stem rust, it doesn't grow in those uh, temperatures, so it's a problem of southern India where the temperature is a bit higher. Leaf rust is, is like, uh, at one time it used to be the most important rust in India because it used to cover most of the Indian crop, it used to infect and it used to cause losses. But uh, very recently, like uh, with, with uh, evolution of the uh, virulent races of yellow rust, the yellow rust has become more important because it infects the bread basket of India, the wheat basket of India, the Punjab, Haryana, and the high productive environments. So it can, it can cause you uh, a loss of, say, like 50 million tons of wheat if it comes on in, in these areas in epidemic forms. So Paxinia path, you may be knowing, like Dr. Nagarajan, S. Nagarajan, the ex-director of IRI, he was a pioneer, he was a great pathologist who, who developed this uh, Paxinia path, Paxinia, like the rust uh, fungus, how it, for, for the stem rust and leaf rust, how it uh, evolves, how the races move out from hills in south to, uh, to the plains, and uh, they infect the wheat crop during season. Similarly, for yellow rust, it comes from the Himalayas or from the... Uh, Western disturbances being exposed from those countries and it, it can cause uh, diseases here. Canal bunt is like more important for export purpose. Uh, we are the country, we are a place in Karnal where Karnal bunt was reported for the first time. So our weeds, yeah, they are, uh, they, they are not very high in quality. Uh, uh, as far as international standards are concerned, but then this is again a problem which, uh, uh, which hampers our exports to, uh, to the other countries which are having a zero tolerance to kernel bunt cell. So this is again a major disease in case of wheat, leaf blight. Uh, it's like uh, burning on the leaves, the photosynthesis becomes very low, it can cause yield losses, especially in the, in the hot and humid areas of, uh, of Bihar and Western Bengal or even Western UP. The powdery mildew, uh, it was not a major disease in wheat, uh, but in recent years, uh, like with, with the changing climatic scenario, I will say, when we are having more rains during the crop season, because this, uh, this pathogen will require humid conditions, more hot and humid, so the more rains during uh, the crop season has led to this disease becoming one of the major, uh, major threats after yellow rust, I will say, because we don't have like uh, uh, major resistances for this in our cultivated sources. The loose mud, uh, yeah, of course, it's a disease of very uh, economic uh, importance, but then we know that it's seed control, uh, it, can, uh, it can be controlled using like chemicals, so, uh, which is very cheap and economic. Headscap, uh, um, uh, it's not a major problem, but then uh, it has also emerged like in central and peninsular India, some places get infected with this. There are other diseases like tan spot, septoria, other common ones. Yeah, uh, lastly, I would like to just run through this uh, because those are the biotic stresses that affect wheat. Then when we come to the abiotic stresses, it becomes the climate change. The climate, we, we, can, we cannot discuss uh, heat and drought in isolation or water logging or other things because they're all somewhere, we, we try to group it in, uh, in, the, in the climate change. So you may be knowing the predictions that 1% one temp one, one temperature rise will lead to like 6% yield loss, 9% yield loss in case of wheats. So they have been, uh, this is very, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know how to explain to you guys this because uh, we, we have this prediction that the environment is changing, the rainfall pattern is changing, the temperature patterns are changing, and these were supposed to affect the wheat crop and Indian wheat, uh, like uh, Indian wheat was uh, thought to uh, be affected by, uh, by, by the climate change, but for last eight to 10 years, we are having record production of wheat year after year, like in 2010 and 11, we were around 80 million tons, now we are 102 million tons. So yeah, uh, it's like redistribution of rainfall, uh, like uh, the rainfalls uh, when it comes at a proper stage, like I have already told you, like the areas in uh, Madhya Pradesh or Rajasthan, which is rain fed, when, when, when you get rain at a proper stage, uh, the, production, the production will increase. Similarly, like in, 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 uh, in northwestern uh, uh, India, when, when we have like cooler summers, uh, cooler winters like this time, uh, the, cool, uh, the cool temperatures have, have lasted for a longer time. Like for recently, like you can see like uh, last two or three years, uh, the winters were compressed into, into a, a duration of say two weeks or something where we have uh, very harsh winters. But this year, uh, the winters have, uh, have, have prolonged. So, that, that's beneficial because uh, more, uh, more the winter at the uh, time of tillering of the wheat crop, uh, 
uh, it gives more dealers, it gives higher yields, so it's a better wedge to use. So these, these, these type of factors which, which, which are very indigenous to us, like land for distribution patterns, like the temperature variations, uh, they, they have actually uh, helped uh, the wheat crop in attaining uh, the, the record production that, that, that we are having these days. Like this was again like Indian agriculture was going to be reduced. I don't know much about other crops, but uh, as far as wheat is concerned, uh, we are still uh, like uh, we are able, to, or we can say that we are able to mitigate the effect of this climate change because of our uh, packages, our practices, our varieties and all that. So yeah, at Karnal we have like uh, phenotyping facilities for heat and drought and temperature control facilities where you can you can you can screen against drought, you can screen against heat, you can you can try to develop a system like uh, um, uh, our PI was telling that we can start developing a, a speed breeding facility or something because uh, it becomes very important. Like uh, in the recent years, we can see that the, the, the climate or the weather is changing very frequently. We don't know how the weather will be next year. Uh, but before this, like before 2000s, uh, we, we used to know that which, which environment we are going to breed the genotypes for. We, we never knew that the environments will change because they, they were like constant. We, we used to know that like in March and April, you are going to have this type of environment in this area, so we need to this type of cultivars. But with recently this climate change, all this, uh, we, are, we are breeding for unknown environments. We don't know, breeding takes uh, like eight to 10 years to develop a variety. So we don't know like what's the, the climate going to be of two years. So how can we do like a breed for 10 years? So speed breeding or, or accelerated breeding pro, uh, programs or platforms, they can help you reduce this, uh, this, this period of 10 years into two or three years. So they can be more useful in breeding or improving yield to, uh, improving weed to this abiotic stasis. Again, grown water, I won't touch this much. The drought scenarios, uh, yeah, means we are not able to predict it properly because the uneven distribution of rainfalls in the season across the areas in space and time has led to like, uh, has helped Indian weed program rather. The, uh, means what we need to do, uh, basic things about developing drought tolerant varieties, like you need to have uh, deep rooting, tiller inhibition genes, and all, all those different uh, approaches we try to discuss here. Again, water logging, because excessive rain comes during uh, sowing, after sowing or sometimes it can lead to, but it's not a very major problem. It's, it's a more problem to the areas where we have saline or alkaline soils. Yeah, uh, this, this is uh, one slide which uh, we like to see, like we are sustaining, we are managing we trust. So again, we correlate with this with, with our yields or our production. So uh, after Green Revolution, like it started going in ex exponential growth in uh, production. But, but we can see here, when you observe very minutely, you see here like after 2000s, this variety, PBW343, it was released in 1995. It's a mega variety. It was a high yielding variety. So the yields were, uh, jumped up here. But when it, this variety became susceptible to yellow rust, uh, the yields in this area become, uh, uh, the production uh, lowered because, of, uh, because this variety was grown on more than 15 million hectares of land across India. Every farmer, every researcher, everybody wants to, wanted to have uh, cultivate PBW343, work on PBW343. So uh, the, the better genotypes didn't arrive by the time they should have. So this, this was a lean period here. So this becomes susceptible, the production, production levels decreased, but then uh, we came up with these new varieties like SD3086, WX1105, which were resistant to rust. And again, then uh, we are on the path uh, of having uh, higher yields or enhanced production levels in the country. And of course, yeah, this is the last one from me, like the Indian wheat, uh, the, the wheat uh, genome sequence has been, uh, is now available. So uh, we have this like, uh, you know, that uh, chromosome 2A of this uh, wheat genome. Uh, India was a partner in this uh, sequencing. So this 2A chromosome uh, uh, was sequenced uh, by Indian partners by, uh, across Delhi University and RCPB and PA Ludhiana. So with, with this, this type of resources available, uh, we can still strive to uh, develop the weeds which are more climate resilient, which are, uh, which are more targeted, I will say, for, for the environments, which I say unpredictable environments. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. So any questions or any clarifications?
Yeah, I think I was too fast, huh? Yeah. So we're done? OK, thank you. I think Dr. Saran has some announcements to make.